Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin Meyer. I'm the Director of Development for the Department of Neurosurgery. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that we find you all safe and well. This is your first time joining us for Fridays with Freelander. We've covered many remarkable topics by incredible expert UPMC and University of Pittsburgh neurosurgeons and researchers. If you've missed any of our past presentations and would like to view them, please visit the dedicated Fridays with Freelander page on our department website at www.neurosurgery.pit.edu. I'll also be posting my email in the chat box. Feel free to send me any questions or comments you may have as well. All of our attendees' mics are muted, but you can try. You can type a question in the Q&A chat box, and we'll try to get to as many as we can in our allotted time. This week, we're delighted to highlight one of our extraordinary expert neurosurgeons, Dr. Bradley Gross. But first, I would like to welcome our Chair of Neurosurgery, Dr. Robert Friedlander, to give an update on the happenings from the last few weeks. Dr. Friedlander, thank you, and please take it away. Well, thank you very much, uh, Justin. And again, I uh, want to welcome everybody to uh, 2021. Uh, thank God uh, 2020 is behind us, although 2021 seems to be a little more of uh, the same, but hopefully uh, we're, we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel uh, in terms of uh, vaccines and hopefully a number of cases will start uh, uh, to come down. And again, one of the reasons I'd like to talk about COVID at the beginning uh, of uh, these presentations is to make sure that anybody that needs uh, assistance or an evaluation by a physician, obviously by us in the neurosurgery, but a physician in general, please don't hesitate to contact uh, your physician or, or to come to the hospital as needed. Uh, many of the visits are being done uh, remotely via telemedicine, so patients don't even have to come uh, to the hospital in uh, many instances. But again, uh, the worst thing is that if somebody's in the middle of a medical urgent or emergent uh, matter is to delay coming to the hospital. Hospitals are uh, very safe uh, places. They're, the hygiene is uh, uh, is usually very good, but uh, during these times is uh, extremely uh, carefully uh, done. Everybody gets a questionnaire walking into the uh, hospital, uh, everybody gets their temperature checked, uh, and we're limiting the number of uh, visitors, obviously, to try to diminish uh, the risks of uh, of uh, bringing COVID uh, into uh, the hospital. So again, I urge everybody uh, to come in uh, as, uh, as needed, or at the very least contact uh, yeah, your uh, physicians. Uh, I want to uh, provide a few words about uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Gross. Dr. Gross, uh, I knew him uh, a number of years ago when he was uh, starting his residency and I was still in Boston at the Brigham and Women's uh, Hospital. And I was always uh, very impressed even when I met him there and when I had the opportunity to recruit him uh, here to uh, Pittsburgh, I was uh, completely thrilled. Uh, because I knew he was uh, a, a go-getter, an incredibly active individual. He literally works day and night. I don't know when he sleeps, uh, but a, a really fantastic uh, uh, physician and, uh, and friend, and, and it's great to have him uh, as part of our faculty. He's won uh, uh, teaching awards uh, uh, from our, our residents. Again, it's a coveted honor uh, within our neurosurgical uh, faculty. Uh, he's also uh, completing uh, his uh, textbook on the subject matter that he's going to talk about uh, uh, today. So it's uh, with a uh, great pleasure that I want to introduce uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Gross. Uh, so Dr. Gross, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Freelander. I appreciate the very kind introduction. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about a personal uh, interest of mine in cerebrovascular neurosurgery, that is dural trivenous fistula. Is the objective of this discussion, given the, the breadth of our audience today, is to make a somewhat potentially complex neurosurgical topic distilled into something very simple. We'll talk about their natural history, their treatment, how they present, and, and try again to distill this into something very simple. So durotrivenous fistulas. Dovetailing back to my original Fridays with Freelander talk that was last April, where we talked about stroke in general, which is really what I deal with. I'm a stroke doctor as a cerebrovascular neurosurgeon. And stroke can be stratified into ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke. Ischemic stroke, as you can see here on the left side of this table, refers to when a blood vessel is blocked and there's loss of blood flow to a part of the brain. And as a result, the neurons in that part of the brain don't work and they could potentially die. So a patient can present with weakness on one side, trouble speaking, or a variety of stroke-like symptoms. Hemorrhagic stroke refers to essentially bleeding into the brain, a blood vessel rupture. And in that case, patients can present like they're having an ischemic stroke as well based on where the hemorrhage or bleed is. 
But in addition, they have a problem because the pressure in the brain can be acutely elevated and require an urgent neurosurgical procedure to treat that as a life-threatening procedure. And so my discussion back in April was really focused on the very high volume ischemic stroke that we do here at UPMC. But in addition, we do a panoply of interesting complex cases in the hemorrhagic field as well. Uh, and this is certainly very intriguing to cerebrovascular neurosurgeons in particular. And it's hemorrhagic stroke that leads us into our discussion about dural tube venous fistulas. Now, typically when we talk about hemorrhagic stroke, one of the common things that cerebrovascular neurosurgeon will talk about is aneurysms. And so this pain shows a variety of uh, interesting aneurysm treatments that we can do minimally invasively through the leg, either with coils that you can see here, placing devices in them. Um, but again, we're going to talk about a slightly more rare, but I think very interesting topic, and that is durotubinous fistulas. And I'll begin the talk uh, by presenting a hemorrhagic stroke case. This was a 54-year-old gentleman who, prior to this acute event, had months of swelling and redness in his right eye and all of a sudden presented with acute headache, vomiting, and on examination, he had trouble seeing on the left side of his visual fields. And he has this CAT scan here that shows a hemorrhage here in the right parietal lobe. This is a hemorrhagic stroke. It extends into what we call the ventricles here. And one of our objectives is figuring out why such a thing occurs. And when we worked it up, we found that this patient had, again, we're gonna be discussing in a lot of detail, one of these dural artrovenous fistulas, a variety that can cause symptoms in the eye, as well as in this case, bleed into the brain and we were able to treat it through a little stick in the leg in this case where we put these coils into the fistula to close it off and treat the problem and two years later uh, the patient has done well uh, this is a follow-up angiogram you can still see the coils in it and the fistula is obliterated but we're going to go to, into a lot of detail to try to distill exactly what all this means and why these are very interesting but relatively simple to understand uh, problem in hemorrhagic stroke so my talk this afternoon will be stratified into beginning with just a clear definition of what dural arteriovenous fistulas are. We'll then talk about their natural history, a personal research interest of mine, as well as their treatment, which I hope you all find very interesting. So what is a dural arteriovenous fistula? So the word fistula refers to an abnormal connection. An arteriovenous fistula is an abnormal connection between an artery in a vein. Now, this can be done intentionally. For example, a common thing that you hear about with our trivial fistulas are dialysis patients that need it for dialysis. But in this case, we're referring to a pathologic process, something that we don't want. Uh, and a dural arteriovenous fistula, so dura refers to the lining of the brain and the spinal cord. So a dural arteriovenous fistula is an abnormal connection between an artery and a vein in the dura that is the lining of the brain and spinal cord. So they're actually unique to what we call the neuraxis, to the nervous system, because by definition, they occur in the dura, the lining. So looking down here in this image, this is, this is an angiogram. This is a picture that highlights the arteries and subsequently the veins of the brain. So this is an angiogram. And what you can see is this angiogram is highlighting scalp arteries, as well as arteries of the dura. This is called the middle meningeal artery. It's an artery of the dura. And you can see that there's something abnormal going on here. This is an abnormal angiogram. When we zoom in on that area, this is this artery here, is this artery here, it's enlarged. There's an abnormal connection in the dura, in the lining at the top of the brain here. And exiting is a vein. So this is the angiographic appearance. This is the picture of a dural arteriovenous fistula. Again, an abnormal direct connection between an artery and a vein. So why is this connection a problem? Well, one of the common symptoms that can occur if you have this direct connection, this pumping direct arteriovenous connection is you can hear them. And patients can present with something we call pulsatile tinnitus where they hear, it's typically on one side, sort of their heartbeat of banging in one ear. And that can be indicative of an arteriovenous fistula. That can be quite bothersome. And certainly patients who hear this, they don't know what it's a harbinger of. Is it something dangerous? What is this? Um, it can be a real thing, and that can be a durotriovenous fistula. But what really concerns us as neurosurgeons is when they could potentially do damage to the brain or spinal cord. 
And so the problem is that if you have this abnormal arteriovenous connection in the lining of the brain that's pumping, that's hitting the veins abnormally, they can prevent the brain and or spinal cord from draining normally. And that's where problems start to occur. So in the brain, if the brain cannot drain normally, then there can be a backup of blood flow and you can actually have a hemorrhagic stroke, a bleed. And so that's one of the ways, as I got into this discussion, talking about hemorrhagic stroke, this is one of the ways that dural arteriovenous fistulas can present, that is with a hemorrhage or a bleed into the brain. But in addition, simply from preventing normal blood flow out of the brain, fistulas can be symptomatic, not simply because of bleeding, but they can mimic an ischemic stroke. They can mimic a brain no longer functioning because it cannot drain properly. So patients can present with weakness on one side of the body, trouble speaking, or even seizures because of this backup of blood flow. So some of these symptoms can obviously be very significant from a durotribunous fistula. By analogy, in the spinal cord, if you have a durotribunous fistula in the lining of the spinal cord that prevents the spinal cord from draining its blood flow normally, you can have dysfunction of the spinal cord and actually present with symptoms as significant as paralysis. Now, durotribunous fistulas can also impact the eye if they sit behind the eye. Okay, so they can cause a backup of flow from the eye, causing redness, swelling, or a prominence of the eye, something we call proptosis. They can cause double vision or even vision loss. Now, this angiogram in this slide here on the right shows a durotribunous fistula behind the eye. And I just think it's a nice illustrative case where you have, this is the fistulous point in here in the, what we call the cavernous sinus and there's backflow, this abnormal venous outflow, and here's where the eye is, and the eye cannot drain normally. So a patient like this would be potentially presenting with redness, swelling, or prominence of the eye, or even trouble with their vision. And so this is a turodrivenous fistula, what we call the cavernous sinus behind the eye, that can cause significant eye symptoms. And so here's just a picture from uh, my old medical school textbook. This is from a Netter uh, textbook, and this just shows the dura, the lining of the brain. And this shows the arteries nourishing the dura, okay? And it's within the dural leaflets. It's, it's, it's a focal area. Dural tribunus fistula is, is an abnormal live piece of dura where within the leaflets, within this covering of the brain, there's an abnormal connection between the arteries and the veins. Now, after that connection occurs, there's one of two ways that the fistula, the venous outflow of the fistula can pass. One way, which I've delineated with this blue arrow, is into what we call the sinuses, into these large draining veins that just are a nice highway out of the brain. When a durotrivenous fistula occurs and simply exits through a sinus, it generally does not have a risk of pressurizing the vein, uh, excuse me, pressurizing the brain and causing stroke-like symptoms or bleeding. These are fistulas that can, you, a patient can hear if they're located down behind the ear here in the transverse sigmoid region. But in general, these are not considered dangerous fistulas, okay? On the flip side, if the fistula decides to drain into a normal vein or what was a normal vein that drains the brain, what we call a cortical vein, if it drains into the cortical vein backwards, delineated here in red, that is a type of fistula that can bleed into the brain that can be dangerous and that can hemorrhage. And these are the ones that concern that can concern us a lot. And so these are the two ways that a fistula can flow out of the brain, either into a sinus, which we think of as the more benign type of fistula, or into backflowing backwards into what was a normal, normal draining vein called cortical venous drainage here. Okay. And so this is an example of how these fistulas can in fact masquerade as other pathology, which, which is very interesting. Uh, particularly in the spine, but also in the brain. So this was a case I encountered in residency of a 74-year-old who was deemed to have had a stroke. He had what we call a right temporal stroke. Uh, this is a CAT scan of the brain. This darkness here in the right temporal lobe, it's, it's, this is right, this is left. This darkness was thought to be a stroke. This patient had a history of atrial fibrillation, and so that is a potential risk factor for causing stroke, which is how the, this initial path of a diagnosis was, was made. And the patient was thought to have had a prior stroke two months prior to, con, prior to this presentation. He had new confusion and weakness on one side of the body, the left side, and he was admitted for a new stroke. And he had an MRI that to an eye less familiar with fistulas, 
uh, would be potentially concerning for a brain tumor. Uh, but a thoughtful uh, person said, this doesn't look quite right. I'm um, actually, for, for those that are following, that are familiar with these, you know, these are retrograde pulsating veins here. This is what you usually see. These are these are abnormal veins draining backwards that are actually a harbinger for a durotrivenous fistula. So this patient had an angiogram and indeed a durotrivenous fistula was in fact the problem here, not a stroke, not a tumor. And the patient was able to be cured of his problem after an embolization procedure. Um, so it's quite a change in, in prognosis and overall outcome when you find these is these are often very curable forms of both ischemic like stroke symptoms or frank bleeding into the brain. So again, a durotribunous fistula is an abnormal connection between an artery and a vein in the lining of the brain or the spinal cord. People can hear them and the main issue is that this connection pre prevents normal venous drainage and that is why they are a problem. They can cause bleeding into the brain or they can mimic strokes by causing the brain dysfunction because it can't drain normally and the same can occur in the spinal cord and because the eye is right in front of the brain they can backflow into the eye from usually a, what we call a carotid cavernous dural fistula or rarely one that's lower down near the frame and magnum called the marginal sinus. All right so having defined durotribunous fistulas it's important to define how dangerous they actually are. What is the risk of having an event if you have a durotribunous fistula? And so we're going to talk a little bit about their natural history. It's a personal research interest of mine, and I hope to make this as, as clear as possible. It was, in fact, in 1972 when uh, a group from the Mayo with a very familiar name, the neurosurgeons watching, Albert Roten, um, discovered that the most important thing with these durotribunous fistulas, previously often called durotribunous malformations, um, is their venous drainage, right? I've already emphasized that, that if, again, if they drain into these cortical veins, that is how they are dangerous. And this is really the first paper in 1972 that explained that importance. Now, really, even until today, uh, gosh, over 40 years later, the original scheme that defined the natural history of dirt venous fistulas, defined by Professor René Jean, Jean is really what has withstood the test of time and is really what we use to classify fistulas today. Unfortunately, most forget that it's actually his classification and neurosurgeons often use this term board in classification. I use it as a resident, but it's actually incorrect. It's actually Rene Jean John's classification if you read the literature carefully. Um, he wrote this textbook in 1978 uh, called Super Selective Arteriography of the External Carotid Artery, which is a must read uh, for any endovascular inclined um, neurosurgeons, radiologists, neurologists. It's, it's one of the most beautiful uh, textbooks with incredible quality angiography for the time. But in this textbook, uh, Dr. Jean clearly delineated four types of durotrivenous fistula based on their venous drainage. And it's really, again, this classification scheme that we now use today. Uh, so there's this type one fistula, which is one that only drains into the sinus, okay? And that's down here on the right, this is delineated by this letter A, where you're just draining into these venous sinuses. And these are the ones that can't really bleed into the brain or cause brain dysfunction for the most part. Type two was one that drained into a sinus, but there was so much pressure in the sinus that normal veins had backflow in them. So you had reflux into cortical veins. And so these, these type two fistulas, are dangerous in the sense that they can cause hemorrhage into the brain or cause brain dysfunction because of abnormal venous drainage because these cortical veins, these veins that are supposed to drain the vein, drain the brain cannot drain normally. Type three fistulas were those that drain directly into cortical veins, okay? And it's these that we know can cause hemorrhage and potential variety of other symptoms because of abnormal blood flow from the brain. Right here, it's delineated by D. And then type four were type three fistulas, those that drain directly into veins of the brain, cortical veins, but the veins are also ectatic, meaning they're dilated, like they're getting ready to rupture. And that's delineated the letter C here. This is a type four fistula where again, there's this venous ectasia. And these are thought to potentially be the most dangerous ones for hemorrhage. And again, it's this classification scheme, type one, type two, type three, type four, that Professor Jean Jean delineated, that really is what we use today. Uh, in 1995, there was a paper in the journal of neurosurgery. Uh, Dr. Shukart was the senior author, Dr. Bourne was the resident at the time on the paper. And the purpose of the paper, if you actually read it, 
was to take the Xinjiang's classification scheme for fistulas of the brain and try to apply it to spinal uh, malformations. And this never really caught on, but, but most people uh, actually refer to the Xinjiang classification scheme instead as the Borden classification scheme. But really, the Borden paper was actually about spinal cord malformations, and we don't actually use it for spinal cord malformations. Um, they excluded the type 4 designation because it did not fit well into their spinal cord classification scheme. Um, uh, again, the type 4 is an important designation when there's that venous ectasia because these are ones that can potentially uh, bleed into the brain, so it's important to keep that designation, which is why, again, the original scheme is the most useful. Uh, Dr. Xinjiang's pupil, you can see he authored this book with Jean-Jacques Merlin. Um, his pupil, Jean-Jacques Merlin, in the same year in 1995, authored a paper as the senior author was Christophe Cognard, um, where they described actually five types of fistulas, again, acknowledging that this was an extrapolation of the Xinjiang scheme. This is a scheme that is a little bit more detailed that we still certainly, we do use today, uh, often referred to as the Cognard classification scheme, that still has the type one, those, the more benign fistulas that drain directly into a venous sinus, but stratified the type twos into those that drain into a sinus, but do not drain into the cortical veins. These are not thought to be associated with acute rupture in general, but they're sort of getting ready to become this type 2B where you have reflux into these cortical veins. Okay, the 2A plus B is where you have backflow and drainage into cortical veins. Still the type 3 where you drain directly into a cortical vein, which can cause hemorrhage or a variety of neurological symptoms. Type 4 where you drain directly into cortical vein and there's venous ectasia. And then type five was a different designation where you drain into spinal perimedullary veins. These potentially cause spinal cord symptoms as well. Um, this is just a more detailed classification scheme. Um, but the, the significance of the classification schemes is that they give us insight as to the risks that these fistulas pose to patients. So uh, when I was a resident, we did this analysis of our own data in Boston and amalgamated that data with data that was already in the literature to try to delineate what is the natural history based on these different types for venous fistula? So when we looked at the type 1 fistulas, that is those that drain into a venous sinus with antegrade normal flow, okay, we found that the mean age of patients was 51. There was no significant sex predilection. Most of these were at the transverse sigmoid junction, that is behind uh, the ear. Um, uh, and about all, a little over a third were in the cavernous sinus that is behind the eye. These are fistulas that can cause eye symptoms. And we found that the annual bleed rate was 0% for this uh, cohort of fistulas. Type 2 fistulas are those that drain into a venous sinus with retrograde flow, with pressurization of those normal veins of the brain with cortical venous reflux. These can cause bleeding. Uh, we found that the mean age of patients with these fistulas was 60. Um, most of them were at the transverse sigmoid sinus or the cavernous sinus as well, and they had an annual bleed rate of 6%. Type 3, again, was those that drain directly into the normal veins of the brain, into the cortical veins. Okay, We found that there was a slight male sex predilection among patients with this type of fistula, and these were located more uh, along uh, structures of the skull base or the tentorium, uh, as well as along the uh, the bottom of the frontal lobe, the anterior fossa, and these harbored a 10% risk of rupture. And when you increase that to a type 4, which is again a type 3 fistula, but where there's dilation of the vein, venous ectasia, the annual bleed rate went up to 21%. So clearly what this part of their natural history analysis demonstrates is that the venous drainage is a very important factor for risk of fistula hemorrhage. But in addition, the presence of venous ectasia is significant as well. Now, presentation modality is also significant. One of the general adhered to maxims in cerebrovascular neurosurgery is that asymptomatic lesions or abnormalities are more likely to stay asymptomatic than those that present symptomatic, that is with hemorrhage or neurological symptoms. Um, that's, a, so that's a fact with aneurysms, with AVMs, with fistulas as well. Uh, and so when we looked at all of the types of fistulas that had cortical venous drainage, type two to four, and we looked at those that were asymptomatic, they had an annual hemorrhage rate of 10%. If patients had neurological symptoms in their brain due to poor venous outflow, focal neurologic symptoms, what we call NHND, non-hemorrhagic neurologic deficit, those fistulas were associated with a 10% risk of rupture, whereas those that presented with hemorrhage had actually a 46% annual rebleed rate uh, after bleeding. 
Um, this is a very high re bleed rate, not quite as high as a ruptured aneurysm, but nevertheless uh, very significant and certainly meritorious of treatment uh, if you encounter a ruptured fistula. We performed a subsequent analysis a few years later where this new analysis was across three centers where we excluded partially treated fistulas. And this subsequent analysis confirmed the importance of venous drainage, presentation modality, and again, ectasia of the venous system, dilation of the venous system. Um, this is just a table excerpt that shows annual hemorrhage rate uh, stratified by the type of presentation, whether it was a non-hemorrhagic neurologic deficit or frank hemorrhage. And what we found is that uh, collectively, if a fistula presented with a hemorrhage, it had that similar risk of rehemorrhage, annual risk of rehemorrhage, 46% in this study. And if you were presented with a bleed, you were more likely to rebleed. Whereas if you presented with a non hemorrhagic neurologic deficit, you were more likely to, in the future, have another non hemorrhagic neurologic deficit as opposed to a bleed in the future. So if you present with a non hemorrhagic neurologic deficit from a fistula, you had a 23% risk of having another one within the next year, as opposed to a 3% risk of hemorrhage, which was another interesting finding from this study. But again, these three main factors, how the fistula drains, whether it presents symptomatically, and whether there's venous ectasia are the significant risk factors uh, for a bad natural history. And another thing also to highlight, location, 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 is that there are certain tendencies for certain fistulas in certain locations to act or drain a certain way. So fistulas along the anterior fossa, that is in the front of the brain, underneath the frontal lobe, or ethmoidal fistulas, these if they're, um, they're not found incidentally, unfortunately tend to present with hemorrhage. So that's this fistula down here at the bottom left. Um, this is the eye of the patient. This is the back of the head over here. This is the ophthalmic artery, the eye that the artery that goes to the eye that's also supplying the fistula through what we call ethmoidal branches. These fistulas have a high tendency to present with hemorrhage because number one, they tend to present uh, they, excuse me, they tend to drain into cortical veins. But number two, in the frontal lobe, if there's some venous backflow or venous outflow problems, it tends to be less likely to be symptomatic. And so these will tend to just present with frank hemorrhage when the venous backflow is significant enough. Now, carotid cavernous fistulas, these are ones that I alluded to as those that are behind the eye delineated in this second pane here, where you have retrograde flow into what we call the superior ophthalmic vein. The, the vein that drains the eye back up of venous outflow. And so these carotid cavernous fistulas tend to present with eye symptoms. About a third of them will also have cortical venous drainage and can also potentially present with hemorrhage. Transverse sigmoid fistulas, those located sort of behind the ear here, the transverse sigmoid uh, junction here, uh, these are the ones that present with tinnitus, that banging, that ringing in the, that banging behind the ear. Um, that can often lead to their diagnosis. But in addition, about half of them can have cortical venous drainage and thus present with a non-hemorrhagic neurologic deficit or hemorrhage. Other locations, superior sagittal sinus or convexity fistulas, these are fistulas along the top of the head or the upper back of the head. These have a high tendency to have cortical venous drainage and so they present typically with non-hemorrhagic neurologic deficit or hemorrhage unless they're found incidentally. Similarly, the deep fistulas or those along the tentorium or, or the petrous ridge uh, tend to also have a, a high proclivity towards having cortical venous drainage and thus present, unfortunately, with, with malignant uh, presentations such as non-hemorrhagic neurologic deficit or hemorrhage. So it's been a, a bit of a tour through first, again, defining durotri venous fistulas, understanding their natural history, that again is largely predicated on their venous outflow, how they flow out through the veins. Uh, we're now going to talk about what I find the most interesting and fascinating part of Dorotri venous fistula, and that is their treatment. Uh, it's important to cater the treatment as to what is best for the fistula. Most often it is endovascular, which is my specialty. Um, we'll talk about endovascular approaches through the arteries, that is transarterial, and through the veins, that is transvenous. We'll then talk about surgery, um, where surgery can be used quite simply and effectively to disconnect the fistula. And radiosurgery is also an excellent option in appropriately selected fistulas with, with nice outcomes, uh, quite frequently illustrated at the University of Pittsburgh. So endovascular from the inside of the blood vessels. Okay, so endovascular therapy refers to going inside the blood vessel uh, to treat or to diagnose a lesion. So in fact, endovascular approaches are the first step for durotubinous fistulas because they lead to the diagnosis. The way that you diagnose a durotubinous fistula is you undergo a catheter angiogram. That is a minimally invasive procedure where a tube is advanced from the artery in the leg or the wrist into several of the neck vessels, 
to do an evaluation for the presence of an abnormal connection between an artery and a vein when you're looking for a dura venous fistula. It's important to do a full six vessel angiogram, look at all of the blood vessels and cover all the vessels. There's a small vessel that can be very, uh, that can be easily missed, the ascending pharyngeal, if you do a selective external and internal injection. So I like to do common injections, that is inject the common carotid artery lower down to make sure I don't miss it. Um, this was an interesting case to show that. This was a patient who presented with a hemorrhagic stroke. This is bleeding into the cerebellum. There was also bleeding into the tentorium in the subdural space. There's an MRI that shows these enhancing corkscrew refluxing veins that keys us in that there's a problem here as a fistula. And in fact, the only way that we initially saw the fistula was, this is the late part of a common carotid injection because it was supplied by the ascending pharyngeal artery. This is a tiny little fragile artery. Uh, this is what we call a super selective injection where we have a microcatheter all the way up by the fistula in the ascending pharyngeal artery, demonstrating the cortical venous reflux of this type three fistula along what we call the clivus, garnering the diagnosis, obviously critical so that we can treat this fistula and prevent it from bleeding again, because we know it has a high risk of re-rupture. So again, endovascular therapy is part of not only the diagnosis, but frequently the treatment of durotrivenous fistulas. And when you're treating a durotrivenous fistula, an abnormal connection between an artery and a vein, the key is to obliterate the connection, to completely close it off, and close down the proximal, the early part of the draining vein absolutely fully. If you only partially close it down, if there's still some vein left, the fistula is going to come back. It should be expected. And so what I like to believe in how I was trained is that the true judge of a, of a complete obliteration of a fistula is a delayed follow-up angiogram. That is, several months later, after you think you've treated it, you do a full repeat angiogram to ensure that there is no evidence of recurrence or residual fistula. And so when we talk about treatment, as I've already alluded to, you can either go from the arterial side, from the nourishing artery to the fistula, or backwards from the venous side to try to close this abnormal connection point. So what we call transarterial therapy, which is the more common approach, where we put a catheter, as you can see here, into the artery nourishing the fistula is one way. And what we usually do is we inject a liquid, an occlusive liquid, into the fistula to close it off. The simplest is literally superglue. N-butyl cyanoacrylate is a liquid embolic that we use. It was actually, in my last talk, Friday, we were talking about how some of the earliest work with it was actually done at the University of Pittsburgh by Dr. Charles Kerber. Um, but more commonly for durotrivenous fistulas nowadays, we use onyx. We inject onyx. And what onyx is, is it's a precipitate. So it comes as a solution where it's dissolved, unfortunately, into dimethyl sulfoxide, which, which has a bit of an odor to it, but it disappears. Uh, the dimethyl sulfoxide evaporates and you're left with this spongy precipitate that casts and occludes the fistula. And so what's happening with this small ascending pharyngeal fistula is this is actually a picture of what the onyx looks like. It actually looks like I'm injecting the contrast into it, but this is actually onyx that's casting the draining vein of the fistula here and obliterating it through a transarterial approach. And this is what you like to see is a lot of onyx going into the vein, not too far, but really fully filling the vein. Transvenous approaches that I'll also, also talk about is where you go backwards into the vein that's draining the fistula and either put deposit little coils to close it off or also potentially some of these liquid embolics as well. Um, so just a paper we wrote uh, a few years ago about using the ascending pharyngeal as one of the conduits to treat fistulas. Um, onyx has had a tremendous impact on the ability to treat durotrivenous fistulas. When I was in Phoenix and had the opportunity to work at the Baronological Institute, looked at an expansive experience there uh, that my mentors, Dr. McDougall and Dr. Albuquerque had to lineate outcomes and learn about treatment trends uh, across a pretty large cohort, 260 treated fistulas. And we found that onyx had a significant impact on the ability to really close these fistulas down and get a lot of embolizate into them. You can see that prior to the onyx era, prior to 2006, the obliteration rate was 60%, whereas with the use of onyx that it went up to 76%. Um, you can see the ability to cure these fistulas through a transarterial only approach, through a single artery, um, significantly increased um, after uh, onyx was introduced into the treatment armamentarium. This is what it looks like when you get onyx. You have 
First, you have a syringe for your DMSO. This is the solvent, the dimethyl sulfoxide. So you, what you do is you first flush your microcatheter with the dimethyl sulfoxide, and then you inject the onyx. It's this black, it looks black. It's, it's mixed with dimethyl sulfoxide in these as well, and you inject it uh, into the fistula or into the lesion to obliterate it. We use it for a variety of useful reasons, but it's a cohesive, not adhesive substance like n acrylate or superglue, which is another thing that can be used as well. So here's another illustrative simple case of a transarterial embolization. So this is a six-year-old who presented with a seizure and had headaches and some subjective weakness on the other side of the fistula. You can see here in the lining of the brain, this is very prominent, the abnormal draining vein. Okay, we went through the middle meningeal artery, an excellent conduit to use uh, to the fistula. This is the microcatheter run and we injected onyx into the fistula. This is what the cats, you can see it looks like it's obliterated, but it's important to look at the CAT scan and at your onyx cast to see that you've completely gotten onyx into the draining vein to totally obliterate it. And one of the indicators that you've done a good job is that you get reflux or you get backflow into other arteries that had previously fed the fistula. This is a good indicator that you're really closing down that vein when you start getting some of the other arteries uh, that we're feeding the fistula from a single arterial pedicle. This is an important finding that should be seen if you really think you're curing a fistula transarterially. But also there's some variance on a the theme. This is a, an interesting case of a six-year-old gentleman presented with an inability to speak or receptive aphasia with this temporal lobe hemorrhage who had this complex type 3 durotrivenous fistula. So this is the normal carotid artery. They have this classic sort of remarkable appearance to them, but it's fairly simple. There's a live piece of dura here that is supplied by direct arteries of the carotid artery here, middle meningeal arteries. These are arteries of the dura and several occipital arteries. So this is the back of the head here. This is the front of the head, several occipital artery branches. And again, the key is to close down the fistulas point. Now, I always like to try to embolize first from the middle meningeal artery and get very good penetration from it. But after, in this case, not surprisingly, I did not get the complete fistula occluded after a middle meningeal embolization. And so I was left with this myriad of occipital arteries that were supplying the fistula over here. And so one of the nice advantages that we now have, in addition to the use of onyx, is using these balloon microcatheters where we inflate a balloon and the onyx just pushes forward into the fistula. So I put a balloon microcatheter into this largest occipital artery feeding the fistula, inflated the balloon and pushed onyx, but the onyx penetrated part of the fistula, but also started refluxing into other branches and started to risk gluing in the balloon catheter. So I had to stop. So after I tried to get the whole fistula with the balloon, we got the front part of the vein, but not the back part of the vein, there is still residual filling. And unfortunately, there's no points for getting 50%, 30%. You have to get the whole fistula. So what we're left with here is these small occipital artery pedicles feeding the fistula here. But the problem is if I just try to put a catheter into this artery and inject onyx, it's all just going to go to the scalp. I'm not going to be able to really penetrate and get this part of the fistula. So in order to sort of force the onyx into the fistula from the suboptimal branch, what we did was we put some coils into the distal part of the occipital artery as sort of a backstop. So we put some coils back here first and then used a balloon microcatheter. This is where the balloon is. This is where the microcatheter tip is. We use the balloon microcatheter to force onyx into the fistula. And so it's just showing the onyx injection here. This is a video. Here's the onyx and it's hitting up against those coils, but it's being forced into the fistula site here. And this is what it looks like. It's this black looking substance, radio opaque substance. And we can see the onyx penetrating the draining vein and successfully obliterating the fistula going where we want it to go. And so this patient had four month follow-up. You can see this is the before angiogram. This is the four month follow-up angiogram that shows persistent obliteration of the fistula. This is his follow-up CAT scan. His speech is improved. And, and this is sort of the intriguing and intellectually stimulating part of these fistulas is trying to figure out creative ways to get them safely and effectively treated. And again, this was a nice way to treat it without having to do a craniotomy or open up um, the head. So some illustrative cases of what we call transvenous embolization coming from the other side. These are some carotid cavernous fistulas. Those are the ones that are behind the eye that can cause eye symptoms and also hemorrhage. 
Okay, these are often treated through transvenous approaches here. So here I have a little microcatheter going through the cavernous sinus into that abnormal vein, that superior ophthalmic vein that's backflowing into the eye. We coil from the superior ophthalmic vein to block that off into the cavernous sinus and results in closing off the fistula, often mitigating potentially debilitating eye symptoms here. That's, that's what you're typically concerned about with these fistulas. Um, this was that case I showed earlier of a carotid cavernous fistula that in the blue here drained into the eye causing eye symptoms, but in the red also drained into the brain and led to a hemorrhage. And so we also coiled this fistula off transvenously. You can see the result here. Um, this is inside the fistula with a microcatheter and this is these are the coils and this is the result. This was another fistula that we treated transvenously fairly recently. This gentleman unfortunately presented with an intracranial hemorrhage, a subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, akin to what patients present with unfortunately ruptured aneurysms with. You can see um, there's a large venous pouch. This is a type four fistula. Um, this pouch was uh, along the, uh, the anterior pons actually, bunched up against the clivus. Um, there's supply from primarily the artery of foramen rotundum on this angiogram, also accessory meningeal and middle meningeal. And you can see the venous drainage here. Um, this is the venous outflow of the fistula from this, from this proximal lactatic pouch all the way out into here. And so this was an ideal case to come transvenous and try to coil it off. Um, this is a video showing uh, some of the transvenous work uh, where we have a wire that is trying to be navigated through a microcatheter, the wire you can see to and fro, carefully finding its way through the venous system down into the venous pouch. And that allows our microcatheter to pass there. And then we uh, insert some coils into the pouch to obliterate this fistula. This is just what the coiling process looks like. You can see the coil is being advanced. And this was the final result. Um, this was an angiogram done a couple months later that shows a durable obliterative result. Uh, from the literature, a uh, simple number to quote in terms of overall the eff efficacy of endovascular therapy is about 80%. So about 80% of fistulas we can successfully close down endovascularly. It depends on their location though and their morphology, especially fistulas, ethmoidal fistulas or those along the anterior fossa in the front, beneath the frontal lobe can be very difficult to treat endovascularly. Um, about 80% of patients with tinnitus will note improvement after endovascular therapy, uh, and about 80% of patients with ocular symptoms will note significant improvement after endovascular therapy. That's for all comers. This was a simple um, result we found from our evaluation of 260 fistulas in a study a few years ago down in Phoenix. Now, surgical interruption when endovascular therapy is not effective is a wonderful potential alternative option. Um, the surgeries in, in well-selected cases can actually be relatively straightforward, um, where again, the objective is simply to disconnect the draining vein exiting the dura, exiting the lining of the brain. And, and certainly there are far more complex surgeries that, that can be done. We're basically just opening the lining of the brain and identifying a vein and, and, and closing it down as opposed to doing what we call intraaxial or complex uh, other brain surgery uh, for other problems. Um, this was a paper I, uh, I worked on with Dr. Dew as a resident in Boston um, that just correlates. This is, this is actually what it looks like surgically where you have the lining of the brain, the dura, and abnormal veins exiting the dura, and it's simply these that need to be disconnected. Um, this was an interesting case of a fistula that was embolized here several years ago, several times that just kept recurring after embolization. You can see the coils and the onyx that's actually in the draining vein, and here it was uh, definitively treated by Dr. Gardner, where he cut out the lining, the dura, with the draining vein in order to really treat this uh, rather refractory um, fistula with some nice intraoperative illustrative pictures in a paper that we published a few years ago. So one of the things I mentioned are these ethmoidal fistulas, these fistulas that occur along the frontal lobe, along the skull base. These are very effectively treated and most often treated with surgery. We did this uh, analysis when I was in Phoenix of cases there, pooled across the literature, almost 100 cases, and found that uh, the majority of these had were high risk. They had venous ectasia. The obliteration rate was basically, basically perfect with a very low permanent complication rate. Um, this is just showing the view below the frontal lobe with the clip on the fistula. Again, these are very uh, effectively often treated with surgery. Um, and uh, this is just a nice illustrative case here. So radiosurgery is another option for treating these durotribunous fistulas. This is 
uh, focused radiation at the fistula site to gradually cause it to obliterate. You don't have to open up the head. This is very minimally invasive uh, and is a really good option for appropriately selected fistulas. So uh, in those that cannot be embolized, um, it is a wonderful consideration, uh, particularly for patients that have uh, bothersome symptoms with type 1 fistulas or patients, again, with higher risk fistulas that cannot undergo surgery for some reason and cannot be embolized are also potential candidates for radiosurgery. Um, looking at a literature review now a little bit dated of about 560 durotribunous fistulas treated with SRS, stereotactic radiosurgery, obliteration rates about 70%, kind of similar to ABMs, which is another good indication for well-selected uh, radiosurgical cases. Um, Complications was relatively low, permanent complications in 2% of cases. Uh, hemorrhage was relatively infrequent. Um, when we looked at factors influencing the effectiveness of stereotactic radiosurgery, the cavernous location, those behind the eye tended to respond the best in terms of obliteration. Those that did not have cortical venous drainage, high risk venous drainage, tended to have uh, better results and smaller ones as well. Um, one of our uh, outstanding uh, now chief residents, he didn't write this paper when he was a chief resident, I've had the opportunity to work with him as an endovascular fellow, Dan Tonetti, did a couple of interesting analyses with uh, the PIT data combined with the literature uh, on stereotactic radiosurgery for dural ABS. This was a paper looking at, again, as we mentioned, those without cortical venous reflux, potentially good candidates for stereotactic radiosurgery. And when we looked at uh, control of patients' tinnitus uh, across our cases and those in the literature, um, you can see 80% resolution rate, basically the math, the 20% improvement rate, Pati patients generally did better with their tinnitus, uh, patients with ocular symptoms and cavernous fistulas, the vast majority of them did significantly better and well-selected for radiosurgery as well. We also looked at um, high-risk fistulas treated with stereotactic radiosurgery. Again, Dr. Ney did a lovely job as the first author on this paper in coordination with senior author, Dr. Lunsford, um, where they looked at Durotrivenous venous fistulas with cortical venous drainage that did not present with non-hemorrhagic neurologic deficit or hemorrhage, we call these non-aggressive fistulas. And it was found that after radiosurgery, uh, none of these really had uh, hemorrhage uh, over over 200 years of patient follow patient years of follow-up. So potentially uh, these high-risk fistulas that do not present with aggressive symptoms if they cannot be treated with embolization, you can see that those well-selected for radiosurgery uh, potentially can have it as an excellent option for treatment as well. And so this is just a summary mal uh, management algorithm for fistulas. Again, um, if a patient has tolerable symptoms and they don't have cortical venous drainage, so uh, oftentimes you can consider observation, um, but if they have intolerable symptoms and uh, an fistula or any fistula with cortical venous drainage, we generally consider embolization first line if that's feasible. If it's not feasible, stereotactic radiosurgery for low risk fistulas um, or those that are higher risk that are perhaps asymptomatic is an excellent consideration or surgery uh, for those, uh, again, that are higher risk in particular that cannot be embolized uh, are, are wonderful uh, treatment options. So. To summarize what we've discussed today, this is a whirlwind tour of durotribunous fistulas, again, a personal passion of mine. Uh, durotribunous fistulas represent an abnormal connection in the dura between arteries and veins. Uh, the main problem is due to impairment of venous outflow. Their natural history is predicated on their venous drainage, how the patients present, and venous ectasia. They can be treated mainly through endovascular, that is minimally invasive means, uh, but surgical disconnection and radiosurgery are excellent alternatives when they are indicated. And really uh, an optimistic and pleasant concluding remark to say is that you can really get comprehensive care for durotribunous fistulas at UPMC. Uh, we really have a, a wonderful team of endovascular practitioners, uh, a vast, vastly experienced team of excellent surgeons that can disconnect these and obviously a, a storied radiosurgical history at UPMC uh, where again a patient can come here and really get the best possible care for their fistula uh, however it, it needs to be best treated. Uh, with that I want to thank you for your attention and I'll uh, close my slideshow. Thank you so much Dr. Gross what an incredible presentation incredible career and we're very fortunate to have you with us here in Pittsburgh. Uh, we're going to begin the Q&A portion of our presentation. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, Dr. Friedlander, would you like to begin us off with a comment? Sure, thank you. And uh, uh, Dr. Gross, thank you for a really outstanding uh, presentation. I know this is one of your favorite uh, uh, topics and uh, clearly you uh, are a world leader and becoming really dominant in, in, in this field. One of the parts 
components I'm very proud of, and uh, as, uh, as uh, Brad mentioned it uh, towards the end, really it's the comprehensive nature of, uh, of management of these lesions uh, here, that we have great strengths uh, on the endovascular, on the open surgical, and on the radiosurgery side. But uh, maybe, uh, Brett, would, would you uh, describe a little bit about the decision-making process on how to treat these uh, lesions? You, you did have that on your, on your last slide, but talk a little bit about the collaboration between the group. Oh, no, absolutely. Um, it, it's, it's a very healthy collaboration. In general, these patients come to attention on the, in, I'll, I'll talk about the inpatient and the outpatient management. So the patient is an inpatient, typically they present with significant stroke-like symptoms or a frank hemorrhage. And so those cases will typically come under the neurosurgical service under one of our cerebrovascular specialists. Um, we have cerebrovascular specialists that do uh, both open and endovascular therapy like Dr. Lang, those that mainly do endovascular like myself, or several open specialists like Dr. Friedlander, Dr. Gardner, Dr. Xenonos, Dr. Wecht. Um, and the first step is to do the angiogram to make the diagnosis. So that angiogram will be done by an endovascular specialist. And once the diagnosis is made, um, almost invariably, uh, the open surgeon managing the dural tribunus fissure will, will typically come down to the angio suite or review the, or review the case and, and put their head together with the endovascular neurosurgeon uh, or endovascular practitioner, endovascular neurologist to say what is the safest and most effective treatment. We typically for these will give endovascular a first pass, but we know that if there's risk to critical structures, or for example, I had a recent case where we did do endovascular first pass and it closed about 90% of the fistula and I don't believe that 90% counts. And you know, my colleague, Dr. Gardner, uh, did a wonderful job just finishing it off and, 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 and curing it. Um, you know, we, we, we basically always do what's best. We typically do an embolization approach first for these, but if I'm worried about the risk of embolization, like for an anterior fossa fistula that's ruptured, um, we'll typically uh, take that to the operating room. Or for those that are inoperable, or for a lot of the outpatient cases, which is, which is now a transition to talk about patients who have more benign fistulas, so those with tinnitus, uh, we have a, a very cohesive discussion often with radiosurgery, with Dr. Lunsford, um, and with the patient to see if embolization or radiosurgery is perhaps most effective for uh, outpatients with less acute symptoms. But it's always a multidisciplinary discussion where because of how busy we are at UPMC, we're, we're all about just doing what's best, not about doing voluminous number of cases. We're all about picking what's best for the patient. We're very, we're all strong believers in that. Yeah, great. So I wanted to, before uh, Justin gets uh, to questions, really to uh, underscore the importance of uh, that last comment that you made, which is it doesn't matter how the patient comes in, what part, uh, through which practitioner or through the emergency room or through a clinic, uh, we all work uh, together. And really what's key is to do what's best for the patient and to provide the options. Sometimes, uh, you know, the, the, we ourselves are not 100% convinced that one's better than another. And, and clearly we engage the patient uh, in that, that decision making process, given that there's some, there would be some risks with some approach and then other risks uh, with a different uh, uh, approach. But it's uh, clearly the most important thing is to provide the very best we can for the patient. So uh, uh, Justin, you wanna go ahead and uh, go through some questions? Sure, thank you, Dr. Friedlander. Uh, Dr. Gross, I'm going to just start off with a couple of patient comments here. Dr. Gr Gross is so kind, compassionate, concerned, and very knowledgeable. Uh, another comment here, Dr. Gross is an outstanding physician. I trust him with my life. So just some great co comments that we would all agree with here. Uh, Dr. Gross, what is the recovery process for a patient who has undergone embolism for a DVAF? Sure, so the recovery process for an embolization, if the patient is an outpatient, so if they have an incidentally discovered fistula, or perhaps if they have tinnitus or eye symptoms, the patients typically stay overnight in the hospital and often go home the next day. Alternatively, if the patient presents with a hemorrhagic stroke, um, they're usually in the hospital recovering from the bleeding aspect of the stroke, which can be several days, um, barring any complications or anything uh, beyond that. So in general, after embolization, and this is sort of across the board, it's known that, that recovery is relatively fast after embolization, barring any potential complications. There is always risk of complications with any procedure that we do. It is neurosurgery one way or another, um, but fortunately it's relatively fast. Uh, 
Excellent. Thank you. Um, open surgical procedures are the last resort for the treatment of dural AVs. What percentage of cases require this approach? So I wouldn't I wouldn't use the word last resort in, in, in such a pessimistic sense because I, I would say that a lot of them can be treated through fairly small craniotomies through and, and again the procedure can be very simple if you understand the anatomy depending on the location of the fistula deep complex tentorial fistulas can be very difficult for any modality but those along the surface can be fairly safe to treat um, i would say that the answer to that question is very much predicated first and foremost on the location of the fistula so fistulas anterior fossa so those along the front of the head here um, a small amount of those can be treated with embolization, uh, either transvenous going all the way backwards through the superior sagittal sinus, uh, or rarely transarterially through the ophthalmic artery through the eye. But most of those are treated with surgery, and, and most of those patients do do very well. As a matter of fact, um, what I would say is that uh, is that for your typical, let's say, superior sagittal sinus, so convexity fistula, where I'll look at it and often want to to embolize it up front. Um, I would say sort of that 80 to maybe a little higher, 80 plus percent rule applies where about 80% of them can be embolized. And probably the remainder along the superior sagittal sinus if they're high risk would be treated with surgery. So so 10 to 20% with surgery. Um, you know, I, I don't I don't believe in, if, if I think the fistula is very simple to be treated surgically, I'm not gonna do three or four embolizations on it. I think that's preposterous because I, I can just, you know, work with, with a partner and, and, and get the best possible treatment for the patient. Excellent, thank you. Is it common for dural AVs to be unintentionally found on an MRI or CT scan? Oh, that's a great question. It's relatively uncommon, far less common than incidentally finding an aneurysm or even an AVM, one of their sibling vascular malformations when it's in the brain. They're more common actually in the spine than AVMs but they're relatively infrequent, far less than 1%, for example. But they can be incidentally found. I've probably seen a handful of incidentally found dural AVFs. Okay, thank you. Um, how often do patients with AVs never experience any warning sim symptoms? Um, that's, that's a tough question to answer because we don't know really the, the true numerator denominator. Um, I would tell you again, those frontal uh, fistulas are those that we usually only find either incidentally or with hemorrhage. Those have a tendency to sort of have that no warning symptom. But otherwise, um, a lot of them can present again with eye symptoms before, or usually if they have cortical venous drainage, the high risk ones, which is the ones you're worried about, patients can have sort of subtle neurological symptoms beforehand. When, I, when you talk to these patients that have these hemorrhages, they say, yeah, you know, I had trouble speaking a couple days ago or I had tingling on my right side and they really don't have otherwise stroke risk factors and I think that that's that's an interesting question to prospectively quantify but um, at this point you know how often do you have warning signs or not I would say the majority of the time you actually do if you look for them but unless they're these frontal frontal fistulas but otherwise um, otherwise you would Okay, thank you. Looks like we have a, a room for one more question here. If, uh, any of the questions we didn't get to, we'll make sure we get to Dr. Gross afterwards. Um, can you speak to the level of expertise that UPMC and the University of Pittsburgh has for treating DVAFs? Um, sure, I, again, I, I, I think that the expertise is, the, the first element of expertise that I think is most important is what Dr. Friedlander highlighted that we're, we're so busy here, quote unquote, that that you don't have a surgeon that's that that needs to do, you know, I, I don't need to do an extra embolization just to do it. That we're we're all vested in doing what's best for the patient, whether it's embolization, surgery, or radiosurgery, all excellent options for these. That's step number one. But step number two, I would say that given the volume of cases that we do, humbly I think that we can certainly provide uh, excellent endovascular care. Um, I, I didn't show off some of the fantastic surgical cases that partners like, like again, like Paul Gardner, or again, uh, George Zinanos, Robert Friedlander, Dan Wechter, Mike Lang, all of them can do uh, wonderful work with. And um, it, the radiosurgical literature is, it is inundated with cases from Pittsburgh. I, I think the literature sort of speaks for itself as to the, the expertise of my colleagues that I'm certainly delighted to 
be be very laudatory and, and uh, <laughs> complimentary about. But again, I I am very confident that given our experience as a group here with the arteriovenous fistulas, that we can really provide the best possible care. Thank you, Dr. Gross. Again, thank you for an incredible presentation. Uh, Dr. Friedlander, would you like to close us up for the day? Well, thank you, uh, Justin. And again, uh, Dr. Gross, really fantastic uh, uh, presentation, a topic that I know is very uh, dear uh, to you. Next week, uh, we're going to be taking a break for a, a very good uh, reason. We're going to be doing one of my favorite things uh, to do for the whole uh, year, just to give you a sense. We're going to be interviewing uh, neurosurgical applicants. Um, you know, we get approximately uh, 400 applications uh, for four spots uh, in neurosurgery. We select a number of uh, people that we interview over several days. Usually the interviews are in person this year. Interviews are all uh, virtual, which uh, has its uh, uh, challenges, but we'll spend all of next uh, Friday uh, interviewing really a, a wonderful and amazing group of uh, medical students that are uh, looking to match uh, for a uh, neurosurgery position here at uh, Pittsburgh. So the week after, actually, we're going to have one of our illustrious uh, alumni uh, uh, be our uh, guest speaker, Dr. Costas Hatsapanayas, uh, who's at the Mount Sinai uh, in New York, uh, will be speaking uh, uh, the Friday after. So again, uh, have a healthy and safe uh, weekend and week, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Uh, thank you very much.